On this episode of the Infinite Loop Show, we are not to be disturbed. <laughs> also, we get new weird info about Steve Jobs. And why Rim wants us to wake up. Yes, you. I'm talking to you. Wake up! <laughs> All that and why the Otters are secretly plotting against us on the Infinite Loop Show. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Infinite Loop Show, episode number 15. I am Michael Gaines. And I am your co-host, Casey Coughlin. <laughs> What's with the otters? I don't even... You wrote this. I don't even know what I said. What's with the otters? Nothing. They're awesome. They're, They're the new pandas. <laughs> no, really? So we're going to get Otterandia in WoW next? Oh, <laughs> miss of otters. <laughs> the planet of otters. Yes. Where everyone just floats around and cracks nuts on their bellies. <laughs> I don't even want to know what you mean by that. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Let's get to the news. I think I'm first this week. Uh, Rim admitted that they were the people that were behind what we thought was the Samsung campaign about Wake Up. This is in response to the, uh, the video that we talked about last week where a, a bunch of people dressed in black, all black, got off a bus with these signs in their hands there were black signs and white letters big white helvetica letters that said wake up wake up in there they they surround this apple store in australia saying wake up wake up wake and they don't even say anything else and then they walk down the street with the whole wake up thing yeah this and the whole- buses were just like no signage other than wake up as well it was just the these huge tour buses all black no icons or nope. anything except for the words wake up on the mm-hmm. side and the video was put together by someone who was an australian blogger well it turns out that rim did it rim wants everybody to wake up because of their new blackberry that, operating system right no, of course they do like clearly wake up we're in last place <laughs> yeah start buying our phones <laughs> They have absolutely no chance. Wake up and make a decent fucking phone. No, they have no chance between iOS, Windows, and Android. I I, I just don't no. see Rim surviving another year, maybe two. No, yeah, no, this made more sense if it was Samsung because they actually have a chance. Yeah, and you know their Galaxy Note. Um, yeah, but that's that's hardware kind of. Well, yeah, they make hardware. Oh, I mean, oh you mean because Rim makes both the OS and the hardware? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, okay. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense no matter who's doing it. <laughs> I mean, I don't... Really, I mean, if you're just going around saying wake up and nobody has the slightest idea who you work for, what you're referring to, who's supposed to wake up, mm-hmm. what... You know, what kind of sales pitch is that? If I just, like, went down the street and said, buy this, buy this, yeah. and nobody's like, buy what? Who? What are you what? talking about? Who are you? What are you talking Who are about? You? Like, right, that's that's an awesome marketing strategy. And Rim should really be applauded for yet, you know, another huge blunder in a series <laughs> That they've been making over, you know, years. Yes, so we're not very impressed by the whole campaign. It's not clever. It's obnoxious. And I don't think it's going to really get anybody to do anything. iOS has already got a foothold. Android's got a foothold. Windows Phone 7 is is gaining a foothold. Windows Phone 7 has a bigger foothold than Windows. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Well, not to discount the whole business sector with, with BlackBerry, but I mean, BlackBerry is just getting a bad rap lately everybody's moving to other operating systems especially Um, after that outage um end of last year i think it was that huge worldwide Mm -hmm. blackberry outage um that's when my company just went you know no no more screw this we're moving off of get a get a windows phone get an Mm -hmm. android if you want we're not you know we're not renewing blackberries and we're not issuing out new blackberries to new users yeah my um my sister works for a big company here and they're moving away from blackberry and for that to happen 
is huge. They're moving iPhone. And I'm not yeah. saying that I'm not saying that because I'm like we're doing an Apple show. I'm just saying that they're, that's what they're doing. It, no, it, there's it, a it, huge shift happening in enterprise right now, mm-hmm. and it's and it's really bad timing for Rim. I think these are two separate shifts too, mm-hmm. where one is like Rim has been continually messing up, you know, with their server outage and just dropping the ball continually. But in in spite of that. Um, iOS has been gaining more and more of a foothold Mm -hmm. and has been gaining more and more trust. And especially in enterprise, this is really kind of surprising. Mm -hmm. You know, where Macs were for so long looked upon as, as really like a niche kind of like, oh, that's cute. You know, you over there in the corner, you (laughs) whatever, stay over there. Um, But more and more enterprise type settings are adopting them in really record numbers you know so it's it's almost like this would have been a pretty substantial shift no matter what but mm-hmm. then coupled with rim really screwing up it's like astronomical yeah i don't see any rim fans in all my circles and i'm not, i don't mean google plus circles i mean just like my <laughs> circle of my circle of people that i know i don't know a single person that that has a blackberry or um, or likes them, or defends RIM. Everybody I know has uh, it's iOS, Android, and then a little bit of Windows Phone Seven. Yeah, and that's no, no, it. no. Anybody and who has a BlackBerry, I look at them like that's a feature phone. That's not. A hard <laughs> Do you really? Phone. No, <laughs> seriously. I'm like, <laughs> oh, you have OS. a BlackBerry? I'm sorry. <laughs> Get with the program. Yeah. Do you sell drugs? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. They're like the. What, is what that you your saying? burner phone? Yeah. As um, you were saying, it's. I like watched the wire. I know. The I know. beeper. The beeper of uh, 2012. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Blackberries. Wow, we're really ragging on rim, aren't we? All right. No, you don't want to ride the rim too I, much. Yeah. Well, we're getting. Get I'm, yeah, I'm not even gonna. I, it almost came out of my mouth, and I caught myself. I'm like, no, I'm not going. There. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna say, and I was like, no, I'm not going there. All right. All right. Um, but hey, it's okay because we got new concept art that's totally unofficial of the iPhone 5. This is pretty wicked, even though it's just concept art. I love me some concept art. You know, seriously, it could be the craziest concept, never have a chance of coming into fruition, and I will drool all over it just the same. <laughs> I, um, it's basically a thin iPhone, uh, iPhone 4. Yeah, it's it's saying that what possibly an iPhone five with a bigger screen and a thinner um, like thickness mm-hmm. would look like if made all out of liquid metal. Mm-hmm. So it almost, I mean, if you were looking at it just from the sides, like the buttons and everything of the concept, almost look like a Android phone. Mm-hmm. But the screen and the overall concept just looks fantastic. Yeah. I would be very happy with a phone like that. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. Um, it's better of a concept that I like than the um, the one with the curved back from about what the one that ago. looked like a magic mouse. Look, I tell you, it looked kind of cool at first, and then I thought, yeah, it's not really practical from a phone's point of view, from holding it and and everything yeah. like that. But I mean, it looked cool. But no, this one is is really the, nice. I think that's the <laughs> that's the whole idea. Like that's all these <laughs> people are striving to, you know, achieve is looking cool. How disappointed would you be if the new iPhone five looked exactly like the iPhone four S, but had really really cool features in in the new OS? They they would have to be like super amazing. They're, because I think I would not just me, but I think a lot of people would really be disappointed. There are a lot of people disappointed when the 4S looked the same, mm-hmm. you know, and that's like really kind of a, a a fine line that they can tread. You know, I mean, they can swing that, you know, using the same case one more time and get a little bit more mileage out of it but Mm -hmm. there are just people that expect a whole new redesign and they want a whole new redesign and and apple's a little bit to blame for this because you know they upgrade a lot and their business model is kind of predicated on you know you upgrading all the time and so we've come to expect new designs and new things and it needs to look different (laughs) because i need to upgrade but I also need to like, 
you know, um, I need that upgrade to be warranted. So yes, but the way that I see it <clears throat> is that other than maybe some design issues that may solve problems, mm-hmm. does the I mean, how much can you change the way a phone looks? It's a, a lot. phone. I mean, every it, time they've changed the redesign, it, it's almost completely different. Well, uh, well, I don't have them here, but I've got like an iPhone one and an iPhone three D, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and. Yes, they're different. Into, like they've got the curved back and everything like that, and and the bezel is a little different, but they're not radically different. No, okay. Well, I mean, they're not like, like one year's a square and one year's a triangle. <laughs> but I mean, you know, like from the one to the three G, mm-hmm. there was different materials being used entirely. Like True. the whole back was a different material it was a different shape True. it was thinner and then from the 3g to the 4 again totally different materials on mm-hmm. the back different shape altogether. <clears throat> i mean sure okay all phones are gonna have you know kind of the same overall features True. and look it's still a freaking phone it's not a <laughs> microwave well I, but, don't forget the antenna on the outside yeah, but my point being is that if the iPhone five came out and it looked almost exactly like the four S, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't care so much. I would care more about the features of the phone than the design of the outside. At least for now, maybe, maybe the six, I would expect a little more. I, I want to say, yeah, I'll be, I would be above all that superficial <laughs> bullcrap, but I can't. Like I know in my heart of hearts, I would just be really kind of disappointed and i would want yeah. a new look that's fine that's fine all right uh we got some news about an odd patent that apple had had filed for nine years later steve had this idea of having an ad supported version of mac os 9 back in 98 99 where when you started up the the mac on startup as I just said, it would play a video, it would play an ad, a commercial or something, and that would be a free version of Mac OS 9. Mm-hmm. And they they had the whole thing all worked out, but for some reason they dropped it. But it's an interesting concept. Would you, back in those days, when updates were 100 bucks, mm-hmm. would you have paid $100 for uh, a new version of Mac OS? <laughs> I don't know if I would want an ad. I don't know. Version. I mean, well, I, it's hard to say. I mean, I was a lot younger, so a hundred bucks would be a lot more money, <laughs> That's and it true. would be me. Like my parents wouldn't buy that. Um, this just seems like so unlike Apple, and really so unlike Steve. Like when he came back in the late 90s he got rid of all the clones for number one because Mm -hmm. he was against licensing the os and in a way like this ad supported free os is is in a way it kind of feels like licensing it does i could see where he was maybe coming from with this whole thing i'm i'm sort of glad that they got rid of it because i don't Mm -hmm. think i would have gone for that no i don't think it would have been unprecedented for any computer os you know at that time if they went ahead and did this with ads and like nobody else was doing this and can you think if if say they did this they rolled it out and then other like linux or anybody else caught on to this Mm. what kind of world we might be living (laughs) in today if everybody was like ad supported os's are okay well i don't know if linux would have it but windows most probably would have for sure. Oh yeah, for Windows is like finally we don't have enough room on the <laughs> box to put ads. We can now put them in the OS. Thank God. Yeah, today I don't think that would happen, and there would probably be easy ways to get around it. You know, just do like a ch mod on the folder, or you mm-hmm. know, something like that. I'm sure the operating system itself could get around that very easily, but I don't think that would work today. Besides, I, I'm Apple, glad it wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Apple's only charging thirty bucks for the upgrades now, so it's well now. It's now like, they, yeah, yeah, but it's an interesting idea, and they're patenting patenting it now. And this is true. They might pull this out of the closet later. <laughs> 
I don't see how it would work. Well, maybe for other operating systems, and I don't know in the future. But yeah, it's it's an interesting idea. So mm, hmm. yeah, hopefully they won't put that patent to any kind of good use. Mm-hmm. But you know what else is uh, ten years old? What apparently Apple security features. <laughs> um. A report says that uh, the real reason Apple's security is 10 years behind Microsoft's Mm -hmm. is really because it didn't have to, you know, kind of catch up with today's virus standards in in the way that Microsoft had to. Mm -hmm. Microsoft was getting hit with viruses and Trojans left and right, and they really had to step up and do something about that and kind of take control of the situation Mm -hmm. um, in a big, big way. I mean, they had majority of the market share. I mean, you know. But Apple, they've enjoyed a long and (laughs) virus-free life, and us as Mac users, the same, to where our practices can kind of be lax. We don't have to be as vigilant. Um, You know, people flock to Mac because there's no viruses. (laughs) But... Um, and so in that time, like, you know, I'm Apple's programmers and everything. They don't have to take that stuff so seriously. And even Apple as a company themselves scoff at third parties that make, uh, security and antivirus software for the Mac. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have any antivirus for the Mac. I haven't had antivirus for the Mac since maybe OS 9. I don't even have antivirus on the Windows side of my Mac. Well, I don't have any virus software, antivirus software on my Windows machine, but that's because I never use it for browsing or anything. The only time I ever open up a browser on my Windows machine is to deal with some of the companies for the games that I play. Now, is that just like the way it has been, or is it a conscious effort on your part to not open a browser because you're afraid of downloading or getting hijacked by something it's both i have windows defender on there which is which is just there on windows 7 so if if anything would ever come by i would hope that it would tell me but i i just make a conscious effort like you said to just never open anything other than like i'm going to battle.net or Uh worldofwarcraft.com could i type Mm -hmm. it in accidentally the wrong way sure but I just generally don't use that machine because I've got two machines here. If I, if I really needed to go to worldofwarcraft.com, I would just do it on my Mac anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, the only time that I've ever had to do that, like for example, um, when I was in the Guild Wars 2 beta this past week, excuse me, I hit the microphone, this past weekend, I had to uh, log into the Guild Wars 2 website and download the client using the browser, obviously. And so mm-hmm. that's how I did it. But But that's it. Now, could I have downloaded the the software on the Mac? Yeah, I guess I could have and then transferred it over. But I don't want to do that. So I just don't. So for me, it's not a big deal. But anyway, the point is that, see, these articles are written in such a way to make it sound like, well, you know, Apple's uh, 10 years behind on Microsoft and Microsoft's so awesome. Well, you know what? They they don't have to be. No, yeah, exactly. And that that was kind of the gist that I got at, you know, that title of the article. Carl is meant to be shocking, I'm sure, yeah. and yeah. it works. Um, <laughs> but it's not like Apple was sitting there going, "No, no, no." <laughs> um, they didn't have to be. I mean, they weren't getting like they weren't under constant attack like Microsoft was, and even Microsoft in the early days wasn't keeping up as much as they are today with it. Mm-hmm. You know, they've gotten better over the last 10 years. And I so, have to say, yes, they have. To the point now where it's fairly stable and they're fairly compliant and they're, you know, I mean, it's still, I wouldn't say the best, but again, they're under constant <laughs> attack. So yeah. um, they've had to step up their game, whereas Apple isn't. So they're just like, meh. 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 Yeah, <laughs> indeed. All right. Um, in some developer news, Apple released the, uh, an update to Mountain Lion. Developer oh, preview. Oh, that's weird. Hmm. What? What's weird? Nothing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mountain Lion Developer Preview 3 is out. I did not grab it. Um, I'm still sort of 
messing around with my machine. My, let me let me just uh, say one thing. The the app that I've been working on for the iPhone and the iPad, uh, we sent it out for approval. We mm-hmm. have not gotten word back yet. Okay. I'll, I'll get to that in a second why I brought that up. But um, there are no major features except they have a do not disturb slider button uh, on the, uh, the notification yes. panel. So that now if you just don't want to be disturbed, the messages will still come in, but but the machine won't tell you that that they right. came in. Because so, Mountain Lion kind of has growl on steroids going mm-hmm. on. Right. So this kind of makes sense that should you want to be uninterrupted or if you're in a meeting or just trying to get some serious work done, mm-hmm. this is a nice feature. And they probably got a lot of feedback and hence why this was put in. Right. And then there's a new Xcode 4.4 preview, which, again, I haven't looked at. I, I really want to. So let me go back to my, my point about how my app was submitted. There's a reason I'm bringing this up in the developer um, part of this, is that when we submitted everything, we made sure that we're using proper API calls and such. My boss sent me uh, a link yesterday, and it was about people that were using the Dropbox API. Uh, yeah. I know There's this is not on our list of this. things. I, I forgot to put this on our list, Casey, so I, I apologize for <laughs> no, that. No, but um, what's happening is that all these people that are using Dropbox apps, the created Dropbox apps, are having them denied because of the fact that now this is what happens. There's a rule in the developer guidelines that says that from an app, you cannot have a link that brings you to, a, uh, that uses Safari to bring you to a site to sign up for a service. So what that means is that if you download the Dropbox app and you don't have a Dropbox account, there can't be something that brings you to Safari that allows you to sign up for. They just want uh, everything to be an app for fear of like circumventing their in-app purchasing system. It's the same thing. Uh, what was it? The Kindle app went under. Mm-hmm. Was under fire for mm-hmm. I think because when you went to purchase. Uh, Kindle books within the Kindle Reader app, it shot you out to Safari to uh, Amazon.com to buy the books instead of doing in-app purchases, which Apple actually takes a cut of. So Mm -hmm. they don't want you to do that. I don't like that practice. I got to say, Casey and I were talking about this last night, is that there's a symbiotic relationship between Apple and developers. Is that Mm -hmm. Apple has the ecosystem that people like And then the people write the good apps to support Apple. I see where Apple is coming from. I I just don't agree with their rules. I I really don't. Because, yeah, they're trying to do the whole in-app purchase thing. But you know what? Like, Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because in my case, we have... uh, The the app is based on a service. Mm -hmm. And in order to use the app, you have to have an account. Well... Yeah. If you don't have an account, you download the app and you say, oh, I've heard of this. I don't want to say like what I'm working on. But um, if if someone says, oh, I've heard of this and I want to sign up for it, boom, there's a link right there on the front page. So now we're wondering whether or not we're going to be uh, rejected because of this. And mm-hmm. quite frankly, we're surprised that we haven't heard anything yet because this was submitted on Sunday was it Friday? I don't well, remember. Do they normally reject them really fast? I'm thinking along the lines of if they had known about it, if, if they had looked at this fast, the first screen would have said, you would have seen click here to sign up for an account. Uh-huh. And so because we haven't heard anything back from them yet, either they have a, oh, a rather yeah. lengthy process to test the, the app. Because none of the testers are going to have an account and you can't really test it further without right. an account. So I'm not quite sure how this works. If if you have a an app, that requires uh, an account. Mm-hmm. Do you have to give like a, a? Do you have to create an account and give it to Apple for them to test, or do they just simply run the binary through some sort of checker and make absolutely sure that you're using proper API calls and such? That's a good point. Maybe they do. I don't know. Just to like speed up and uh, automate the whole process. I don't know. That would be. I mean, what they have to be fairly bombarded with app store requests so why wouldn't they want to a speed things up make it automated and b make it so that they don't need 
a human being touching every single app on right. a device. Like, that would just take forever. Yeah. And isn't there... I, I, I want to say there were some complaints early on with people saying that the approval process was too long. Mm -hmm. So, again, in order to shorten that, you know, that probably is how they're doing it. Just some sort of checker that they run it through and it just throws down the code and make sure everything's in place, the right calls, okay, mm -hmm. tags, good, whatever. Sure. They're not QAing us. No. Uh, I'm, and, and if I did know anything, I probably shouldn't be able to talk about it yet. So this is all conjecture on my part. I, I just don't know. Right. But no, we say anything. You know, <laughs> I'm just saying that we don't know what their process is. Right. And all I can probably say is that it's not their job to QA everything. I think it's their job to just make sure that they give a cursory look to everything and say, okay, this follows our guidelines for an app. Mm -hmm. That said, we know of competing apps that um, that do have the sign up link, and we're just wondering what's going to happen. So it's it's an interesting process, and and we already have a plan in place in case we're rejected. It'll take two seconds right. to fix it, one way or the other. It's either going to be the app or it's going to be the website, and everything's all in place. We just have to see what they say, flip a oh, switch, that's good. that's good, and then we resubmit. Or we appeal. It depends if we have to change the binary or not. Or you go home and cry. <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, I don't know about you. I don't like doing taxes very much. Oh, taxes suck. I really, really loathe taxes. And especially when I was a freelancer, I oh. really loathed taxes. And yeah. I was trying to do anything I could to get out and, I mean, uh, pay my taxes legally. Mm -hmm. Um Every cent. Apple, oddly enough, is trying to do the same thing. <laughs> Apple doesn't like paying taxes. No. Um, so they, according to the New York Times, have been routing a good portion. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Routing it through Nevada instead of California, where it's a whole lot cheaper. Hey, look, let me tell you something. If you had that much money, would you let it just go? No, I'm sure they have, like, the best accounting <laughs> and fiscal people working for Apple. I mean, really, they have the best designers. Yeah. They have the best engineers. They have the best lawyers. Maybe not. But I'm sure they have the best accounting people, too, that are you know every angle. And it's really not surprising. No, listen, this, is, this goes far beyond H&R Block. This no, is... And and really, it's not surprising based on any company of this size. Yeah. Like, Apple's the only per only company to do this? No, they're just under scrutiny oh, now because they made Apple so much money. shame on Apple because Enron doesn't do that. Oh, <laughs> oh. Enron pays all their taxes. Could you imagine if Apple was under the same scrutiny as Enron? Oh, my God. No, but... No, I, I, I think if they were... None of this stuff would be coming to light. Apple would just be skating by, la la la, everything's great. I There'd be no scrutiny whatsoever. Yeah, there was uh, one, uh, I, think like, I don't know if it was a congressman, senator, I don't have it in front of me, but somebody was really upset with Apple and just like being real angry about them. And you know what? I, t I, I wanted to say to this guy, look, if you made this much money, would you just let it go? You want to do what's right, but at the same time, you want to protect your own investment. And you have to make your company better. Right, exactly. You're under pressure from the shareholders to be growing constantly, constantly be making a profit, mm -hmm. not be looking to the long term, but looking to the radically short term. You're under pressure from literally every angle, from your consumers, everybody. So yeah. you cut corners. So yeah. you do what, what you have to. Yeah. So... I am not a lawyer. I'm not a tax person. All I right. can say is everybody tries to do their best with their taxes. I, this is no different. It's just on a larger scale, in my opinion. Yeah, it's not surprising. It doesn't make me feel any different about Apple. I'm not like, oh, for shame. You need to wake up about your taxes. <laughs> 
Apple sent emails out to developers asking them to get developer IDs for Gatekeeper before Mountain Lion is released. This is the system in which you have a developer ID which signs your app for the Mac. This is not for the iPhone and the iPad. This is specifically for the Mac. So that when Mountain Lion comes out and you tell the system that you only want to run signed applications that yours is signed. And yours will run if that's what the user um, asks the system to do. Yeah. Now... This can be changed in system preferences. But yes. Yeah. There are three levels. Either you run everything that's signed. Um, you can run things. What was the second one? I always forget the second one. The third one is just <laughs> balls Whatever. of the wall. I forgot what the second one was. The second one is. Um, Does it prompt you? I think I, oh, that's, I think that might be what it is. That it prompts you. Yeah. That would make sense. And then the third one is like wild, wild west. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's crazy <laughs> out there in the Mac OS, you know, atmosphere. Oh, you don't know what you're going to get. Oh, it's crazy. Oh, you're running Java in your browser? Oh, oh <laughs> yeah, that's like having sex with that economy. You're a crazy person over there. <laughs> well, I think that's a smart idea for developers to get their gatekeeper or the developer IDs for, for gatekeeper. Mm-hmm. I don't write any Mac OS software right now, but um, I'll be getting one of these for myself. In case I have some brilliant ideas someday. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just writing for iOS right now. I'm not really writing for the Mac, but I could. I could someday. Can you still write something with AppleScript and get it submitted to the Mac App Store? Oh no! Yeah, that's right. You that can create a fantastic. binary with that. Oh, yeah, it would be. That's an interesting <laughs> question. Let's try it. Let's uh, run something through Automator. Make it in binary. Yeah, Can you make yeah, Automator no, stuff and binary? And submit the Automator script to the Apple. There you the go. Answer. There you go. <laughs> and then watch it be rejected. Like, what? I'm using what? your tools. <laughs> no, what do exactly. you want It's from like, me? your damn API. What's wrong? That would be funny. <laughs> I'm following the rules. <laughs> um. Yeah. Anyways. Hey, um, so Intel, this little company, uh, Intel. Yeah, I heard of them. <laughs> they have this this new spec and motherboard that is literally so small that they say Apple could shrink the Mac, the current Mac Mini, down to the size of the current Apple TV, the little hockey puck. That's pretty and, impressive. And not <laughs> lose anything. It would be tough to stick a CD drive in there, though, wouldn't it? No, 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 no. <laughs> I know. Physical I'm, media is going I'm, away. Why I know. would you want to I'm, do I'm that? I'm being a smartass. Anyway, no, it, it would be very impressive if you can put... I mean, this is like the... Was it the web server that runs in a, on the size of a pack of cigarettes or something that came out years ago? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you had a Mac Mini... God, man, if you had a Mac Mini the size of a hockey puck, that, that would be impressive. Perfect. That'd be, put it in my purse and I could just, oh yeah, let me get it out my desktop computer that's in my purse. No, think about it. If you had the ability to carry around a machine like that anywhere you wanted to go, mm-hmm. you would, I would bet that you would hackers. see, no, no, well, maybe hackers. I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of something positive. I would bet you that you would start seeing kiosks for people to log into oh. wireless systems with a screen somewhere it's like like internet cafes would basically be well you could monitors. You do that with um uh like vm clients mm-hmm. you know but their their boxes are like they're more like a small cereal box mm-hmm. um and those are you know the the uh, the thin clients that just connect to a server so i mean they can already get kind of small but these are this is even smaller, and it's not a thin client. It's mm-hmm. not just pulling a um, all its info from a server. It's everything's local. Everything's right there mm-hmm. on the machine. Mm-hmm. It, I think that would be interesting. Is so you go to a Starbucks, you don't even have to bring your laptop. You bring a little hockey puck, and they've got a screen mm-hmm. that comes out of the table. Mm-hmm. Everything is Bluetooth or the screen. Maybe have a Thunderbolt or or just some sort of mini DVI connector. Yeah, bang! Yeah. There you are. No more laptops. Everything. Well, I mean, then again, you can this do that with an even iPad now. This would simpler than the current iMac. Yeah. Because what's you know what's attached to the back of the screen on an iMac is really pretty massive. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're using three point five desktop hard drives in an iMac, sure. and you think, God, this thing's so thin. 
you know, it's it's mostly laptop components, but they're still using like some desktop components. It's I mean, it's thin, but it's not that thin. Yeah. Like this little guy could could even revolutionize the iMacs to where they would just be like super thin. Mhm. Like iPad thin. Could you imagine like a 27 inch iMac with a screen the thickness of a say a big iPad and then maybe this guy is just in in the base. Yeah. You know, kind of like in the aluminum stand <laughs> buried in there on the bottom. That would be wicked. That would be the sexiest thing. Two or three years, I'll bet. Because look what they did with the Air. You don't think they can do that with the desktop? I bet they could. No, they they probably could, but I think by most people's standards, they if they don't want a desktop that has the same computing power as their laptops. Yeah. And especially their ultra books. People will, you know, take a a slower, less powerful ultra book if it's super thin and lightweight and sexy and whatever. Mm -hmm. So long as they still have their beefy whatever <laughs> truck at home. Hey. You know, but if that truck at home is a is more like a Prius <laughs> then it depends on what you're doing with your computer. If, if you need to do video editing or something like HD video or or whatever, then you need the beefy computers. But if you're oh, just... Oh, yeah, no. Not everybody needs a Mac Pro. You know, no. and that kind of goes back to the um, Mac Pro versus iMac debate. Or right. even Mac Mini for that reason. So, I mean, Mac Minis, I think, sell fairly decently. But, yeah, because, I mean, not everybody needs all that horsepower. Mm-hmm. Ars Technica had a look at Mastered for iTunes. This is a lengthy article. It's about three... Well, it's not as lengthy as some of their uh, their longer articles, but it's three pages. <laughs> Very insightful stuff about how the mastering process goes. And I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to go all into it because I could just sit here and talk about music for hours. <laughs> Indeed. The, the gist of it is that some music... Well, not some music, but but a lot of music is remastered based on the media that it's going to be played on. For example, if you're going to master it for vinyl, it's mastered in a certain way. If it's mastered for CDs, it's mastered in a certain way. And when you're mastering it for iTunes, it's mastered in a certain way. That makes sense. Right. So vinyl has a much different dynamic range than CD. Uh, CD... I mean, th this whole CD versus vinyl thing has been going on forever. And I've even tested stuff at home. I've got some decent equipment. And yeah, you can tell the difference between the two. But then you have to wonder whether or not they were mastered properly for the media. Yeah. I have some SA CDs. I've got some Blu-ray um, albums. And when you get into that kind of space, you can definitely tell the difference. Like, I've got an old Genesis album, uh, Abacab. And it sounds... A million times better than CD. But then you've got some older ones, like I've got an old Black Sabbath album, and it does sound better, but not that much better. And then, like, the difference is not that great. But then you've got Derek and the Dominoes uh, from 73, and that sounds phenomenal. So it all depends on the mastering process. But I'm, anyway, the, the, the point about the whole iTunes <laughs> thing is that what they said is that in some instances, it sounds very very good close to cd they they do these tests where they they do what's called a null test you, you take the waveform and you invert it uh you can do this in audacity so you can do it at home and then you can compare two different waveforms so you can take the cd master import it into audacity you can take an, an itunes or a master for itunes or even a 2496 pull it in and do a comparison and see where the differences are. They mm -hmm. found that in some instances the vocals were different, uh, maybe the bass was different, some of the high ends were different, depending on how things are mastered. Mm -hmm. And the way that I'm looking at this is that they said in the article that 2496 is really not good for consumers. Well, of course not, because most consumers don't have the, the equipment to play that sort of uh, music on and hear the difference. I do. Most mm -hmm. people don't. So it's not, yeah. but but it's necessary for the source because what you want to do is that when you're mastering for different things, the the twenty four ninety six or the twenty four one ninety two source is given to Apple, 
at some point. So they, if they, if they want to remaster everything, if they find something that they can do better, they have the masters to go back to. This is all long winded. I know it is, but the the bottom line is that they said that it's it sounds very good. Yay! <laughs> but it, but it all depends on how well it's mastered. Yeah. If you have somebody who knows what they're doing, then it's going to sound good. If you have somebody that just throws a couple of knobs and 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 thinks that they know what they're doing, then it could possibly not sound good. That happened with uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and. Mm. There was uh, there was a mention of Green Day's American Idiot that said that mm-hmm. it was it was it seemed to be mastered well but it was very loud and mm-hmm. the loudness can have a misperception of sounding better. I have a couple of uh-huh. albums. One specifically is the first Bon Jovi album where it was way too loud. It sounded like if you if you turned it down, you can tell that they did a good job because the original master, the original CD was garbage. But um, th- this whole mu- music is just one of those things in life that is, is just never going to be perfect no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. And so what Apple is trying to do is, is they're trying to make it as best as they can with the equipment that people are going to be playing it on. Yeah, that so, makes sense. So that's, so that's what this means. Mastered for iTunes is like saying mastered for vinyl, mastered for CD. This is like mastered for iTunes. And I think people lose sight of that. People lose sight of yeah. the fact that this that it's it's the equipment that this is going to be played on iPods, iPhones, Macs, that sort of thing. So it's more than just throwing it through an MP3 converter. Even though the, the iTunes uses AAC, I'm just using that as an example. So it's it's a lengthy yeah. article. If you're interested in music and the mastering process, I urge everybody to go listen to it. I I could talk about it forever, and I'm not going to because then Casey's going to fall asleep. <laughs> and there she goes. Um, so yeah, hey, guess what? What? Um, Microsoft just dropped a little bit of money to compete, uh, with Amazon and Apple in the ebook market. <laughs> you know, the last time uh, that Microsoft invested several million dollars into a company, <laughs> they took Microsoft over. Or not Microsoft over, they took over Microsoft's market share. I should, I should be very specific about what I'm saying. And I'm talking about when they invest $150 million in Apple. Yes. Yes. Not- well, they're investing twice that in the Nook. <laughs> so congrats to Barnes & Noble. You're not doing as badly as Borders. Hey, look, I, t- I like Barnes & Noble. I love going there. I do, too. I like them better than Borders. I have absolutely nothing against Barnes & Noble at all. They're, I think they're a great company, and I just... No, and I um, think the Nook is probably... Well, it's better than the regular Kindle. I don't know about the Kindle Fire, but... Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that Microsoft... Well, I mean, I guess it's not terribly surprising because it seems like everybody is now delving into the ebook market. Yeah. But that now Microsoft wants in on this game is, I think, just going to be like when they wanted in on the uh, the music store mm-hmm. game. Sure. Because that totally worked out for them. <laughs> yeah, sure. They can rename the thing the Zook. Yeah, right. <laughs> it worked out so well that they want to kill any occurrence of the name and any like remembrance and reference to that failed enterprise. <laughs> Do you think this is going to help at all? It'll help the Nook. I don't think it's going to help Microsoft. Nobody's going to equate the two. And if they're trying to build up the Nook just to like stick a little fork in Amazon and Apple's sides, mm-hmm. well, then that just... That seems slimy and douchey and totally Microsoft. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm just wondering what they're going to do with this Nook because you know that what's going to wind up happening is that if, if Microsoft is, is investing so much money in this, the, the next Nook is probably going to have Windows, well, Windows Mobile, uh, whatever oh, they call it. Oh, I didn't even think about that. That's yeah. Windows you, 8 sure. on there probably. Sure. Do you think Microsoft is going to put Android on the next Nook? I don't think they would. That's, that's a good point. They're going to have a substantial or semi-substantial say in the next Nook. So uh-huh. to compete with Amazon Fire's iteration of Android, mm-hmm. um, why not ditch Android altogether and go with Windows 8 or Windows Phone 7 thing? Yeah, the timing of this is very interesting. 
That's a good point. That actually that sounds more likely mm-hmm. than them trying to get a foothold in the ebook market rather than just trying to further their own mobile platform. Right. That makes more sense. Right. That's what I believe too. What I also believe is that Steve Jobs dressed up as Willy Wonka would have been really strange to see. This would have been fantastic if they could have actually pulled it off and done it. This story was great. There's a story going around that said what Steve wanted to do for the millionth max sold is put a golden, an actual golden ticket inside the box. And then the person who bought it would have had the cost of their Mac refunded and then their family would have been flown to Cupertino and the had mothership. a tour of Apple. How how, how awesome is that? And That's it would have been totally Willy Wonka. It's awesome. Like almost word for word. And it's awesome. And then you meet Steve Jobs in person. And he's freaking dressed up <laughs> like Willy Wonka. The top hat, the, the coat, everything. He asks you to scratch the wallpaper. It's awesome. <laughs> Could you imagine? You <laughs> you touched iPod software. You lose. He wants yeah. somebody to. He's looking for somebody to run the company. That's you know the irony in that now. Oh, looking I know. back. Oh, yeah. Too soon. The reason why this didn't happen. And I, oh, th- this is almost like how how sad it was that the enterprise wasn't built full scale in Las yeah. Vegas. Yeah, is that yeah. the reason? Is that because in California, if you're going to enter a contest, you don't have to actually buy the product. So the the rule is the law is that mm-hmm. anybody could have entered this, even people that didn't own a Mac. And the whole point of this. Was Just to like with focus really- it on Mac owners and Mac fans, right? So you can't really. Like, Steve doesn't want just any Joe Blow to win this and then come up and be like, what's up, you know? Yeah, yeah, nice place you got here. Yeah. You know, whatever. Like, he wants (laughs) true blue people who are willing to pay the money for the hardware that are fans that enjoy it, that are, you know, and, and rightfully so but yeah our crappy california law and Mm -hmm. it just happened to be you know they're based in cupertino california so Mm -hmm. it's a shame they couldn't make an exception or something it just would have been phenomenal and the marketing would have been funny as hell and oh it would have been fantastic yeah i think it would have been great it's a shame Mm -hmm. silly and all this is coming out now because of that new book um what is it Insanely simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, all this new stuff that wasn't even touched upon in the Walter Isaacson book, which is surprising because that thing was thick enough. Yeah. Um, but it's like all this new crazy quirky stuff. Yeah. You know, this whole quirky side of Steve Jobs nobody knew. And again, wasn't even touched upon. You know, in Walter Isaacson's book, he was a very focused serious driven person and and kind of almost more the steve jobs we know via you know watching him watching apple that's that's more along the lines of the narrative that they kind of played out um this side of steve jobs is a little well a lot more hidden and a lot more unknown and is almost kind of like really hmm hmm no. He wasn't such a slave driver. Well, maybe. <laughs> I guess this, you know, the two can coexist. He can still be a slave driver and a crazy person. But yeah, but the Oompa Loompas were happy. Yes, they were <laughs> happy to be slaving away for Willy Wonka. <laughs> well, they were safe from Oompa Loompa land. This is, this is true. They were... <laughs> yes. Um, but, hey... So, new rumors on the Apple TV, the TV set, Mm. not the hockey puck. Uh, Apple was apparently this last week in talks with Epic's movie streaming about a potential partnership. And people, there's, I mean, there's no word on this, but people are saying, why else would they be in a partnership if it wasn't for this new fabled Apple TV? Mm -hmm. The thing is, Epic's is in a agreement with netflix netflix has sole streaming rights of epic's movies um up until i believe sept 
September. What a convenient time. It's that convenient for the end of the year, just before the holiday season. Apple can just bust out on the scene with this. Er, mm. That's what people are saying. Now, why Epix and not Netflix themselves? Well, they already have Netflix on on the, the Apple, Apple TV. TV. Right, I understand that, but... Maybe, I mean, maybe even Netflix is already in the bag. Therefore, that kind of asks another question. Why not just keep Epix with Netflix and have, you know, the whole thing done and over with? Why right. break it out? Right, so th this specifically is supposed to be for the TV, not the box, not the hockey puck. So that right. when you... And, and that's what I'm saying is that if Netflix is in the hockey puck... Mm -hmm. Why not just put the whole kit and caboodle, Netflix and or Epix? Unless on. there's some underlying agreement that, say, in the contract Epix has with Netflix mm -hmm. that comes under fire for some reason with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's very little information out right now about this new Apple TV. You know, we don't know if it's... what. You know, it, it could even boil down to the, the technology being used, you know, the antenna in it. Is it using over the air at all? Is it just internet based like the Apple TV? Mm -hmm. You know, so it could even know. pertain to something like that. I don't know. But we'll see. Well, I guess we'll see in uh, September, won't we? <laughs> we will, indeed. All right, let's move on to culture. Right, I'm, I'm picking this music at random. <laughs> and I didn't fade it out properly, but that's okay. There's a, a story going around that EA is closing down Rock Band for iOS. And Aww. it's a shame. I, I really think that it's a shame because you know people really like this app. They loved it. When it first came out, people, you're, you've got that look on your face like, what, are you crazy? What, am I wrong? No, 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 no. <laughs> I think you're totally right. This was, It's, it's kind of bittersweet because this yeah. was... One of the first official apps in the App Store when the iPad launched. Mm -hmm. um, people may or may not remember when the first iPad launched, there weren't a whole lot of iPad-ready apps in True. the App Store. It was a, just a sea of iPhone apps still. And there was only a handful of ones that were ready on launch day, and they were showcased because they were. Mm -hmm. Rock Band was one of the few. Mm -hmm. And it was great. I mean, when it first came out. Right. <laughs> and now you get a, a little notification when you fire up the app that says that it's going to be closing at the end of May. Mm -hmm. Not specific to Rock Band for iOS itself, but this is what's been pissing me off about digital downloads itself is that people say well you know digital downloads you can always re-download it well no you can't not if they kill it entirely exactly if they, if they shut it down for whatever reason for example years ago remember the big hot coffee problem mm -hmm. with grand theft auto how what, can i forget yeah uh, so what if theoretically if, if grand theft auto was a digital download and a bunch of states said you know what we're going to shut this app down in Alabama or Arkansas or Oklahoma or something like that. And I'm, I'm going through Bible Belt. Uh, that would be, I, I think, still really different than if um, Rockstar said they were going to close it down. Well, uh, if, like, a state said, we're going to step in here and impede the download. Well, what I'm saying is, in, in general, is that when you have a digital download... Depending on how the digital download itself is is working, if it mm -hmm. talks to a host computer to make sure that you can play the game and that host computer is shut right. down for whatever reason, being that the company shut it down or a state yeah. shut it down, the fact is is that unless you have physical media, you you're at the mercy of whatever, right? Uh, whatever system but that's never going to verify. I mean, that's never going to happen with the iPhone or the iPad. You're never going to have physical media. Right. So, so this is why I, they, you know, even if the game is, well, most games aren't even standalone like downloads to the local hard disk anymore. Most games, like you said, check or ping the server at some point mm -hmm. in there. 
So even if you are totally current on your backups and you're good and you never delete the game and never have to re-download it, it's still going to be broken. Mm -hmm. It's going to be broken and you're going to be shut out of the game that you paid for. And that's what bothers me about digital downloads. And this goes with movies too. Is that what if... And and this is the biggest problem with DivX. People were worried with DivX and Blu-ray is that the theory is that companies could shut down the ability for you to play back your movie. Mm-hmm. And Disney's big with this. They, they, they put out a movie for like four months or something like that, and then they make it disappear for seven years. They put it in the vault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm against physical media. I, I'm sorry, against digital downloads in oh. general, because the physical media says, <laughs> screw you, I'm going to put it in my Blu-ray player, detach it from the internet, and I'm just going to go ahead and play. And mm-hmm. nobody can do anything about it. And I don't like this. Like They say that when you buy a disc, a game, a movie, whatever, a CD, you're not paying for the physical disc or the packaging. Well, I mean, you are to a point, like a few pennies. But you're paying for the license to play it. That's where most of the money comes from. Yeah. And so what if that license is revocable? <sighs> And this that's that's what's happening with, with Rock Band in some way is that Rock Band is is being shut down because if it were a physical media like if, if this were yeah. 1999 and you had Rock Band uh, and EA said you know what we're not supporting Rock Band anymore well you'll still have the you'll still have the game you can still play it on your Mac well now you can't do that now now it's possible for a company to shut a game down I think that's just one of the prices we have to pay for convenience because if you think about it in a way it's still sort of physical media it's just the media is at their house and not yours (laughs) so at any time they can close the door and not let you in anymore yeah and nobody thinks about that with all these cloud services i mean that could be true about Dropbox, Google Drive, they can just end it and all your docs, whatever, you know, you don't have access to. And so iCloud, um, even the the new PS3 uh, cloud-based save service so that you can, you know, port your games from PlayStation to PlayStation easily. You pay monthly for that for the convenience, but all of that can be lost whenever. Whenever, I mean, if you think about it rationally, of course they're not going to keep these servers alive and running forever. <laughs> so, I mean, it sucks that they killed them a little bit ahead of schedule, but at some point they were going to be killed anyways. Right. But what what's the alternative? You have an iPhone with a crazy big no. <laughs> disc that you slide in and out of the back? No. So we pay this price for convenience. You do. But then if you turn around and look on your shelf, there's an Asteroids cartridge. Now, Atari's not around making cartridges, in, or, or you moved it. Now you've got some, uh, was that a Nintendo cartridge? Oh, that's my Nintendo uh, NES game. Yeah, but, but yes, you can still play it. And still. so you're showing the Asteroids. Oh, I, wanna, I want that. So you're showing the Asteroids cartridge to the camera. Um, the Atari, tiny, tiny cartridge in you, a big thing of plastic. But you can still play it 32 years later. If I wanted to. If you or wanted to. Or I could download a ROM and an emulator and play it on my computer, yes. which I would do a lot sooner than trying to find an Atari what 2600 to shove this thing into. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to apps because that's actually related. All right, so the app that I'm picking today, which is actually related to asteroids, and is completely <laughs> is a what coincidence. What a segue! We're like semi-professional. I know. Call Tom. <laughs> tell him we're, 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 we're hot on his heels. This segue territory. Atari's greatest hits for the iPad. I love this app, and I have. I a, need to get this. Yeah, it's for the. You can use it on the iCade. Which is yeah. which was originally an April Fool's joke on Think Geek, and they actually built it. So you slide your iPad onto this holder, and there's a Bluetooth controller with mm-hmm. um, with an eight position joystick and a whole bunch of buttons. Unfortunately, there's no analog control. I, I really wish there was some sort of analog control for some of these, but uh, like Missile Command needs it, Crystal Castles needs it, and uh, Marble Madness is out, but 
God, if Marble Madness ever came out for the iPad, it'd be all over that like white on rice. Um, <laughs> God, I love that game. So um, it has a whole bunch of Atari 2600 and um, arcade games. So you can play the original Asteroids from the arcade. Mm-hmm. You can play Asteroids for the 2600. And you pay like only a couple of bucks for all this stuff. Like you, They give you a bunch of stuff when you, when you get the game at first, but then you have in-app purchases. To buy more ROMs. But, Mm -hmm. God, it's so great to be able to play some of these old games again. And they still hold up. A lot of them still hold up. Yeah. I need to get this. You know what I would be static over is if Nintendo got on this with some of their old NES games. They could do the exact same thing. You buy the the initial emulator app and then in-app purchase all day long. They would make a truckload of money, but they won't because they're stubborn. Because they won't. They, because they want. Why don't know, they like truckloads of money? Because I've got a truckload <laughs> of money. I want them to have it. I want to give it to them. Because it's kind of it's going to cannibalize sales of their Nintendo 3DS. Oh yeah, the 3DS. I forgot that's doing so well. <laughs> they're already contemplating doing their own app store. Yeah, just freaking do it already. I like. Nintendo, I want them to succeed. I want to see their stuff on the iPad. Uh, Square yeah, totally. put Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 3. I don't know if 4 is Yeah, out. right? Square's on board. I don't want to see a Nintendo Game Boy phone come out. Yeah. Just I, license your stuff. Put it on the hardware that's already and, out there and, that people are already using. You will get adoption like that. Yeah. But no, they're going to be stubborn. They're going to come out with a Nintendo phone before they actually get on the iPhone. Yeah, I, Nintendo, as much as we all love Nintendo, I just don't see their handhelds uh, surviving for much longer. They're, no they're, handhelds are. They're all going by the wayside. Well, Sony put out their Vita, and I don't know how well that's doing, mm-hmm. but I'm not... Do you know anybody with one? No. Do you know anybody talking about one? Uh, that bought one? No. I know some people that were given them to review, but I don't know people that actually went out and paid for one. No. I don't even know anybody who's talking about them. No, nobody's talking about it, and that's the problem. No. Oh, good, a new PS handheld so I can rebuy <laughs> all the games again. Again. Like, that's the one thing with PlayStation's handhelds, is every time they reinvent the wheel and you have to rebuy the games... Well, sometimes yeah. because to be fair, you were able to play some of the older stuff in the newer hardware. They just had a cartridge slot on the on Nintendo DS. Okay, you, right on the the Nintendos are better at it than PlayStation mm-hmm. and Sony is. Yeah, but I still Sony have my completely reinvents the wheel every time. <laughs> I still have my PSP and I haven't fired it up in who knows how long. Yeah, I don't even know where Ed had one. I don't know where it is. Yeah. That's how important it is. All right, what's your app? So I downloaded a new app this week that I've been using every day, Mm -hmm. and I have been very good about it. Um, I've been getting more and more into fitness and trying to lose weight and get into shape and just get healthier healthier overall. Mm -hmm. Um, So I downloaded the Livestrong app. Uh, I believe it's either free or two bucks in the App Store. Still, not a lot of money, but it is really well done. It is beautiful, and and what it does, it tracks your calories. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can track each meal, snacks, water consumed, and then also track your exercise. And it hooks up to Livestrong servers, and so you can put in food. You don't have to physically, you know, look on everything and, and look at the calorie count and enter it in. You can just enter in, like... Kirkland trail mix from Costco and it it finds it you know you tap the uh, the appropriate serving or whatever say like I had two handfuls or whatever mm-hmm. and and it knows the calories and everything and so that's great it has a whole database for exercises so you can say I ran and you can say the time and the distance or whatever right I ran upstairs or just you know obscure weirdo stuff like that mm-hmm. Um, it'll also track your weight, so you enter that in manually. But And then it also has a community aspect, which, I mean, you know, I could care less about. But it's kind of nice where a lot of people who have the app um, are also kind of uh, 
almost tweeting. You know, there's short little oh, blurbs cool. in the background saying like, I did this, I'm making progress, yay me, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of stuff. But, I mean, overall, it's it's a well-done app. It's got a robust database so that I don't have to really think about, like, food and exercise. I can just type it in and it finds it and I'm good. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's well designed. the The whole app is really nice. The navigation's nice, and the uh, the graphics, which, like I said before, you know, I will gladly pay more for a well designed app. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, we're all done for this episode. <laughs> episode fifteen is in the can. If you want to contact us, I am at Star Mike on Twitter. Casey is K A C E Y K A S O. The Casey, not the cheese. I still don't understand what that means. Well, like the Trek nerd when he was bare butt. Oh, I see. The Casey, not the cheese. The animal, not the nakedness. Well, that's because... And then I totally copied him. Okay, I get it. All right. (laughs) (laughs) We are at at Infinite Loop TV, and you can email us at theinfiniteloopshow at gmail.com, and of course, theinfiniteloopshow.com. If you have any apps that you want us to review or look at, you can email us and let us know. Like us, give us reviews on iTunes. We'll be your best friends. We will mention you. We'll give you a big <laughs> hug. What? All right. Thanks for watching, everybody, and listening. Bye.